Yeah, so I guess I, you know, I, I, because, you know, part, part of what really a lot of what I'm doing in the early stages of this course is reviewing stuff that you've kind of already seen, but in continuous time. Okay, so I don't want to go too slow on like the solo stuff because you've basically already seen that in discrete time, right? And, and, and so it should be relatively straightforward, but I do want to give you an idea of how to work in continuous time. All right, so I'm going, I'm, I think I'm going, at a relatively brisk clip. Uh, if it's too fast, just let me know. We can we can always go back and review stuff. But if not, then I then I'll just sort of keep this this current pace. Okay. Although I, I mean I will like slow down once we get into Ramsey and beyond. Then I think it's a little bit more stuff that's relatively new. Okay. So um, yeah. All right. So so here we have just a little bit on solo. Like I we basically done everything I think for solo. We did static solo. We added in growth. Saw how that changed the dynamic equations, um, and then and, and, you know, so how to draw these uh, these phase plots and state state space plots. Okay, so uh, what we get at the end, okay, I think this more or less summarizes it is this dynamic equation here, which I'm which I wrote out with explicit of p's uh, in this case. Okay, and um, you know we we talked about the local stability. Okay, if you think about this as just some you know generic g of k function okay you can calculate the slope uh, at a linearized point around steady state um and you find that that's negative here okay and so uh the next proposition is just about global stability okay so with global stability that means no matter where you start you end up at that steady state uh uh this is a, this is for k strictly greater than zero just to exclude the zero steady state um so so with that with that exception no matter where you start you end up at this this um single uh, steady state. Uh, so local is just saying if you start in the neighborhood, kind of roughly speaking, you'll end up there. But um, you can have many locally stable steady states. That doesn't imply global because, you know, it, it depends on where you start. Okay, so, um, yeah, so for global, uh, you know, I mean, really for this case, you know, remember we when we drew the, that's not what I want. Okay, let's see if this works. We drew, nope, not quite. We're almost there. There we go. Um, we drew that graph of k dot versus k, right? And that looked like, you know, there's a zero here. And it goes up and then down. And there's that uh, k star right here, okay? So um, k star. All right, so then, you know, so we talked about this basically implicitly when, when I drew this graph is the the uniqueness okay so in this case the unique the, the global stability it, it's it's enough to just show that it's a unique steady state okay so in that case uh all you need is that it has a unique crossing point after zero um and one way to show that uh is to basically show that the slope at zero is positive okay and then um that uh the function is strictly concave after that okay and then i guess yeah, that it, that that it's uh, well, yeah, a, a little bit more possibly than strictly concave, and this is where we had to uh, invoke um, uh, that's that the the infinity side of the anodic condition. Okay, so it's basically both sides of the anodic condition. The first side, well, not you, you, all you really need for the for the for this uh, left hand side here that it's increasing. Okay, which would mean that the the slope, like okay, so let's just that g of k function. K dot here, okay. In this case, it's going to be S F of K minus for the for the full growth state. It's delta plus G plus N times K. Um, all right, so for that for that to be uh, positive, okay, you just need that you know G prime at zero, which is going to be S prime at zero uh, minus G plus N is greater than zero. One way to do that is with an anodic condition where f prime is zero is just infinity, or you could just have it being greater than uh, delta plus g plus n over s. Okay, so that's kind of an arbitrary point, so you may as well just do anodic. Okay, um, yeah. So that's that's one, um, and then the other side is when you go to infinity. Okay, and then basically there, you know, I guess little limit of uh, of g prime of k as k goes to infinity. All right, is going to be, um, uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's going to be the limit of, 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 
of g prime, which is which I'll write in the general case, right? Is g prime of k is s, which is kind of what we had down there. Okay, um, and that's where the second part of the anata condition is, is the f prime goes to zero as k goes to infinity, in which case this thing here would be negative in the limit. Okay, so. And it, and if it's it has a limiting strictly negative slope, it must also eventually cross down uh, below the uh, the axis there. Okay, so it's strictly concave, meaning there's any crossing point. It has to cross, it has to go above because of the not a, the first side of the condition. So so basically, we get uniqueness of the steady state that's positive, um, and hence uh, global stability. Okay, so. Um, Yeah, so that in this case, and so the reason that you can infer global stability in this case, I guess, is this it doesn't go up to infinity, I guess, is another thing you want to, in addition to being a unique state, say that you don't want it to go up to infinity. Okay, and in that case, it's bounded, there's a unique steady state, and hence it's going to converge there eventually. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah, so that, that's not like the 100% the airtight proof, but I think it's, it's good enough for, for macro, right? So, um, now, you know, when we, you know, stability and, and both in the local and global sense is relatively simple in a, in a 1D case, all right? Once you go to two dimensions, things get a little bit more fun because you can have more exotic uh, behavior, okay? So, um, uh, you know, so if you think about, um, let's just think about some generic 2D state, state space, okay? So, you know, there's, you know, let's say you, you have a steady state here. I mean, you might just converge to it, you know, you might kind of take the long way and converge there. Okay. Or you could, in principle, you know, you could just keep orbiting it. Right. So, so there, there's more interesting things can happen um, in 2D because, uh, well, I don't know why, I guess it's just, there's more room, room to move around. Okay. So you can do things like orbit. And 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 or, or like slowly decay towards something. Okay, um, in the one D world, okay, I mean you kind of just you either go there or you don't. Okay, um, right. So so but but if you think about like you know something like a concept of momentum, right? So not just like in the physical sense, but also like you know like price. Think about like price momentum. People, you know, you're you're. Uh, your friends that are day trading are talking about momentum or something, right? Even though you're telling them about rational expectations, right? So, um, but you know, it, it, it does kind of seem, you know, once you get it, especially once you get into like, you know, crypto basically, then, then maybe there like really is momentum, whether it's rational or not. Right. So, um, but you know, so, so if you, if you offer something like momentum, you know, that, that's, that's kind of like 2d, right? Because you, even if you're moving in a 1d space, such as like a price, uh, because there's momentum, the, the velocity of the price actually is important too. And so that's kind of like your second dimension. So your state space would be like where you are and how fast you're moving, right? Once you have that, then you can then you can start orbiting stuff or like oscillating, right? You would, you would oscillate uh, around a point or something like that. Okay, so um, you cut, yeah. So, so you basically, you need two, di two dimensions to oscillate, okay? But that second dimension could be like, um, you know, the, the velocity in a single like, uh, real dimension. Okay. So, um, yeah. All right. So, so we'll see that I, we like, we won't really see orbiting and, and, and cycles because almost everything we do just like, it really just kills off oscillations for some reason. Okay. Unless you're explicitly driving a system with oscillations, usually rational expectations and things like that will be like, Oh, if I know it's going to overshoot, then I'm going to adjust now and it's going to dampen everything. And so you just sort of in these types of models, you end up just converging sort of in an orderly, orderly manner. Okay, so it's possible, but we end up kind of making assumptions that that generally rule that out. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, so so but the, keep that in mind as we go forward, and things will get a little bit more interesting in in the stability world. Okay, and, and already once we get to Ramsey, uh, it'll, it'll get more interesting. Okay, so. Uh, so that's global stability. Okay. Um, the other thing you do, I'm not going to go through this, but um, actually I will, because it doesn't take that long. Um, the, other, the other thing you can do um, is uh, if you're thinking about the particular uh, law of motion that we had, 
Okay, so um, I'll just read right here. So if if you think about this, and I guess yeah, even in the general sense. Okay, so what I have written on the I'm gonna write I'm gonna switch to the iPad in a second. What I have written on the slides here is for Cobb Douglas. Okay, you can go through and do a change of variables. Um, you can see that. Uh, you're gonna go through and do a change of variables. All right, I should I should probably make these slides thinner because because it's just like if, if I had them so cut off like right here instead that'd be better. Okay, so but maybe I'll do that. So um, you you can do a change of variables of k to the one minus alpha. So x of t is our new variable equals k to the one minus alpha. You sub that in, okay, and you can find just this involves like a couple lines of algebra. Basically, when once you solve through it, um you get a linear system in X. Okay, so in the Cobb Douglas case, you can actually do a variable substitution to turn it into a linear system. We apply that thing that we found last time that you can, this looks more or less exactly like we had last time with the MX plus B formulation, right? You, you do that for these values of B and M basically, and you get this thing, okay? So basically this is your steady state S over delta plus G plus N. This is your initial point, and then this is your decay. This is your m, your decay rate, which is exactly the thing that's attached to x. Okay, so you can you can get the the, the rate of convergence. Okay, and and you'll note that that's the same exact uh, quantity that we solve for as g prime around steady state. That stability uh, notion, because that's m. That's the 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 linear term in, in the in the local space around the steady state. Okay, so that's the same same uh, expression there. Okay. Um, so yeah, you know, you, you'll converge there. So, so this, but remember this is an X space. Okay. So this, this tells you exactly what happens in X space precisely for this, for the Cobb Douglas case. And then you only get to remember, you know, to get back to K space, you take this X and, and invert this. And so raise it to the one over one minus alpha to get K. Okay. So you, you can actually in the Cobb Douglas precisely solve for the path. If that's useful. Okay. Um, Okay, and so, uh, and I'll go through, I'm going to go through this in the general case. Okay, so for, for a case like this, when you do this variable substitution, if you want to go through it on your own, you know, what I, what I always do is just, you know, go directly to the growth rate, because usually things get easier. So if you want to find the growth rate of x, x dot over x is going to be 1 minus alpha times the growth rate of k, which you can compute from right here, right, and plug that in. Okay, so that's another case where it's like, you want to find the you want to do the change of variables and convert a law of motion, do it in terms of growth rates first, and then just move that variable over at the end if you want to. Okay. Uh, but we can do this in the general case too. And I think it actually touches on um, kind of a, an interesting little tech, uh, technique or kind of pattern that tends to show up in, in uh, problems like this. Okay. So, so this is our law of motion. Okay. Um, we can write it in terms of growth rates. So k dot over k, right? Um, so that's going to give, give us s f k over k minus delta plus g plus n. Okay, so we're just dividing by k. Um, all right, and so uh, in the Cobb Douglas case, this would be k to the alpha. And so then when you divide it, you get k to the alpha minus 1 or one over K to the one minus alpha. Okay. So that's, that's where that one minus alpha comes from that substitution idea in the Cobb Douglas case. Uh, but we're going to do this in the general sense. Okay. And so let's see. Yeah. So the, the variable substitution we want to, we're going to do is, is we're going to call it X still. Um, we're going to do K over F of K. All right. So in the Cobb Douglas case, F of K is alpha x to the alpha or k to the alpha so that would be k to the one minus alpha okay so this is the exact substitution that we do in the slides where am I? uh that we do in the slides okay except it's in the general case not the Cobb douglas case all right um all right so then uh what we want to do is is that we're going to take the same approach though all right is just do it in terms of growth rates first and then see what happens okay so let's do the growth rate of x all right so that's going to be, um, well, we can, we can use the quotient rule, right? So we can do K dot over K, all right? And then minus the growth rate of F. Okay, so K dot over K is, it's clear what that is. And then that, the growth rate of F is slightly less clear, okay? But we can work through that, okay? So, but the thing to remember is I remember this is a growth rate over time. So we're, we're, we're the derivatives are with respect to time. 
and there's a T hiding inside this K here, and all these Ks really. Okay, so that this is a case where dropping the FTs can can confuse you perhaps a little bit, but there's remember there's a T hiding inside that K, so it's F of K of T, and we're taking the growth rate of that. Okay, so what we get is for the derivative, we're going to get F prime of K times K dot, right? So F you know, DF DK times DK DT. All right, so it's that's that's the the chain rule happening right there. Okay, um, divided by uh, the value itself, so just f of k, right? So this is what we get for the growth rate of f of k over time, all right? And now this isn't very pretty right now, okay? But there's one thing we can do, which is what we often do is multiply and divide by something. Uh, in this case, we're going to multiply and divide by k on that right term, okay? And I'm going to split it up in a particular way. Uh, I'm going to say put a k here. So k times f prime of k over f of k times k dot over k. All right. So yeah. OK, so so the as, as you can see, right, so we started with this. We're put, putting a k here, basically, and putting a k here. And that's where they show up right here. So they 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 cancel, but they, we're going to keep them for now. Okay. So then we're left with the growth rate times something. Okay. Um, and it turns out that something is kind of like we can talk about it. Okay. So we got k dot over k times basically one minus k f prime of k over k. That thing. All right. So now it turns out that this thing here is is. That's not right. Uh, it's F of K. Turns out that this thing here is kind of a known quantity, which is which is the elasticity. Okay, so um, it's the elasticity of the function F in particular. Okay, so we're saying we're going to define uh, epsilon sub F. Okay. It's just going to be, you know, I guess with respect to k implicitly, uh, it's going to be k f prime over f of k. All right. And so, um, you know, and if you want to, you know, like think about it, like writing it out, you know, you can also think about this like df, you know, that f prime is just df dk. All right. Um, df dk over f over k f of k over k, right? So you're taking the derivative and dividing by the ratio, okay, uh, of, of the function value to the the, uh, the input value, okay? So, so what this basically is doing is turning it from a derivative in terms of levels into like a something like a proportional derivative, okay? So the elasticity tells you if I change the input value by 1%, how many percent do I change the output value by? Okay, or I change it by... If the elasticity is epsilon, I change it. If I change the input value by one percent, I change the output by epsilon percent. Okay, so a unit elasticity means that the things move proportionally the same. Okay, an elasticity of two is that you know input one percent, you get out two percent on the on the outside. Okay, so so it's just like a derivative, but it's it's a proportional derivative. So it's it if you think the you know it's like you know you get derivative. Uh, Yeah, I don't know what the, what's, the, what's the right analogy here, but you know, if you go from a derivative to a growth rate, right? Uh, I guess the thing of it, it, you know, you think about like you know, like the level is a derivative. Um, this is like I don't know, I don't say it's it's a proportional derivative. Okay, so it, it's analogous to a growth rate, but in in terms of uh, derivatives. Okay, um, all right, and and I guess the other. The other way you can also write it, and this is kind of like, it's not really entirely clear what this notation means to me at least, but sometimes people write it like d log of f over d log of k. So it's like, if you took the log of f and expressed it as a function of the log of k, and then took the derivative of that thing, that would give you the elasticity. Okay, so this, it, I always find it weird though to, to, to have log of k in the, the the bottom denominator here, but 
that's another way that people talk about it is it's a derivative like with respect to logs okay which gets back to like the proportionality notion okay um okay so that's that's the elasticity i i mean i think for us this this is just like the elasticity of some function f you know sometimes you might might see like fk so it's f with respect to k right is just the derivative times the value divided derivative times the input value divided by the output value okay um okay and so so the cool the cool thing though is that um if you if you, basically what you guys if you want to find the growth rate of some function f of k that's going to be equal to the elasticity of f times the growth rate of k right but it should be noted though that this thing is a function of k itself elasticity is is in general also a function of k you see that this thing here can be a function of k right i mean it is a function of k right so so it, you're you're kind of breaking up the growth rate so but but it, you know sometimes this will be a constant but in other cases it's not and in general it's not okay so this is a function of k this is a function of k all right um yeah okay so so the but the elasticity is useful because it'll show up when we're working with growth rates and so you want to try to develop a good kind of intuition for what it, what it means okay um all right and so getting back to the the question we're looking at you know if you sub in then you're going to get growth rate of k times one minus the elasticity of f okay and that's x okay all right and so like so so now you can kind of see it's like we, we found the growth rate of x so it's basically the growth rate of k minus growth rate of f the growth rate of f is its elasticity times the growth rate of k and so that turns into this equation okay so like once you really internalize what elasticities are, you can make that jump from just saying, oh, I see this and I can turn that into this relatively quickly, right? Um, but it, it's tough to to get a hang of, of that logic immediately. Okay, so it has to kind of sink in, at least it did for me when I first learned it. So, um, but but once you, I think, get the hang of it, then it, it becomes something you can deploy relatively quickly, okay? Um, all right, so, so that's the general setup. I mean, I, th I think I would be remiss if I didn't also tell you that in the case of like the Cobb Douglas or any like power function, it's it's pretty simple. Okay, so anytime you have something like f of k, you know, is k to the alpha, for instance, as it is in the Cobb Douglas. Okay, you know, if you calculate epsilon f, well, that's just k times f prime, which is alpha k to the alpha minus one over k to the alpha. Okay. And what you can see is that the top side just turns into k to the alpha again because you you just put back that k that you lost in the derivative and that cancels perfectly with the bottom hence this is just alpha okay so if you see a function that's just a power function it's its elasticity is what exactly that exponent okay so so taking the elasticity just picks off the exponent of, of a particular function okay um Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Any... I've never thought about if there's a power rule for elasticities. But there might be. Uh, but I can't decide. I'm going to say, I don't know, but let's, let's defer that until later. We don't actually need to think about that. Okay. So, so let's not get, let's not get off track. Specifically me, I shouldn't get off track. I should stay on track. All right. So, uh, yeah. So the, what we need to know for now is the elasticity in a, in a simple case of a power law, like we have Cobb Douglas just picks off that alpha. Okay. So you can see here, you get that the growth rate of X is the growth rate of K times one minus alpha in the Cobb Douglas case. Okay. And that's exactly what we see. Um, in the, the derivation in the slides when we do it for the Cobb Douglas case. Okay, so this is just a slight generalization of that. Okay. Um, all right, so, but then with this, I mean, basically we're, we're, we're there. Okay, so then um, what we do is we plug it, we plug back in for that K dot over K given what we, this basically. Okay, so, so if you look here, when we plug this in, 
this thing, you know, I kind of chose it like that. This is one over K. So it's not, or sorry, one over X. It's not X, it's one over X. Okay, so this is S over X. Okay, so we're gonna get S over X minus delta plus G plus N times one minus epsilon F. Okay, that's X dot over F. Okay, and then the last thing I'm gonna do is just multiply through by the X. All right, so we get X dot, I'm gonna move the one minus epsilon front, okay, um, times S minus delta plus G plus N times X. So you multiply by X, basically. Multiply by X, that'll cancel this and then add an X right here. Okay, so this is what we get in the general case. All right, and this corresponds exactly to what we get for Cobb Douglas when we use that uh, epsilon F equals alpha. Okay. Um, I guess the only other, I mean, the, the critical thing though, which, which, which I've been kind of suppressing right here is, you know, that really epsilon F is epsilon F of K. All right. But even in this case, what we really want to say is, is that it's epsilon F of um, basically a like K of X. Okay. So, so if we really want to find epsilon in this equation, because it's in terms of X, we would say, okay, well, what is X? All right. What is X? What does that imply? Sorry. What is X? What does that imply about K? Okay. So we need to invert this function. We first of all, hope that it's invertible. Okay. Let's say that it is. That'll give you K. Then you plug K into that elasticity and then you get um, the epsilon F to put in here. Okay. So this is a, there's a non-trivial amount of like computation embedded in this unless it's the constant case of Cobb Douglas. Okay. Um, so, so if, if I gave you some other production function, you could algebraically go through those steps and put something in here and it would probably be pretty ugly, but you'd get something. All right. So, um, yeah. And, and the only, yeah, but, but it's critical that this epsilon F when we calculate it, it's a, it's a function of K. And so that's why you need to add in basically the inverse of this mapping here. Okay. All right. So, okay. So that's, that's kind of like going as far as you can, basically in simplifying that uh, solo model uh, law of motion. Okay. And, and, and adding in a little bit about elasticities, okay, which are pretty useful. All right. So, uh, all right. So, and I think this is, okay. So then that's pretty much it for the solo lecture. This is the last slide here. Um, just giving you an idea of, of different uh, things you can do. Okay. So I guess, um, Yeah, I don't know what that means. I don't know what the first thing means. Second one is is alluding to this AK model. All right, so uh, I don't think we did that. It almost got on the homework, then I think I asked it the last second. Uh, there, there is a model that you can write down where um, basically uh, you can um, kind of write down a production function without labor. Basically, so this is like a totally automated economy, okay? Um, and so that that would look that looks like the reason they call it an AK model is because the production function is f equals a times k, all right? And and basically, uh, that's uh, if you think about the AK model. Oh, that's not the word I want. Model. Okay, so instead of f of k l a being like um, k to the alpha a l to the one minus alpha. Okay, you're gonna have f of k l a. So not this, not this, but this. You're gonna have f of k l a being a k. So actually, l doesn't matter. All right, um, and so. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the case where alpha equals one. Okay, here, All right? It's kind of like just setting alpha equals one and and actually the value of A doesn't matter. Okay, so, so we could even just say that it's just K, All right. So it's kind of like alpha equals one. All right, and if, if you, and, and, and if you look at what do we get when we plug in that for this equation here, so alpha equals one, means that little f would be k. So it's just a linear production, right? There's no decreasing returns. Okay, so that, that's what the AK model basically 
has. Okay, so that so it's basically like meaning f of k is equal to k. All right. When you do that, well, the, if you write down that law of motion, you get s times s k minus delta plus g plus n times k, which means that k dot over k is just s minus delta plus g plus n. Okay, so you just, it's just a number. Those are all just numbers, which, which, well, actually, no, I, don't, I don't know if it's greater than zero. It could be anything, right? We're depending on what the value of those numbers are. It could be anything, but, but suppose it's positive, okay? This just means you kind of just get growth, right? Because there's really no decreasing returns to scale. You can just keep, keep on going forever. And in fact, even if g equals zero, you still get growth. You just get a little bit less, okay? So, um, that, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, you know, you can you can think about it. There's still a population out there. They just don't do anything. This is a, a utopian society where no one has. You just have all these machines that produce stuff. You just sit there and and reap the rewards of it. Okay. So that's so L is still there, and it's even we're even normalizing by L, right? When we when we're writing lowercase k, but like it's is that they're not doing anything? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're not. They're not necessary for production. You need like one person to like press press go, and that's it. Right? Um, yeah. Okay. And so so, but yeah. In that case, you get um, you just get growth, right? Because you 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 produce linearly, you invest some of that, which increases production capacity in the future linearly, and there's not there's no decreasing returns to scale to 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 dampen that. Okay. All right, so I think that's yeah, and so that's that's interesting. I mean, maybe we'll look at it later on, and it shows up sometimes. It, I I look at it as more of a curiosity because you know there are there really is probably are decreasing returns to scale. Okay, so uh, but it's kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, so that's in terms of growth, and in terms of business cycles. Let me jump back to slides. In terms of business cycles, uh, we'll do this later. Okay, but you can you can have um, within this context, you can put in. Like a, basically a stochastic A, so it's like technology shocks are, you know, doing things in the economy, uh, affecting the economy. Okay, uh, and that has an effect on on output and everything like that. Okay, uh, and and investment and all that. Okay, so then uh, you can do, you know, there's different types of stochastic stuff you can do. You can do jump processes where you have like regime switching. You could just do a more continuous sort of normal evolution over time, which is called Brownian motion. So we'll we'll do that later on when we when we go into what's called stochastic calculus and stuff like that. So um, it's kind of useful. Um, and it's another thing that's like slightly different in continuous time than than discrete time. Okay. All right. So yeah. So that's it for solo. Check that off. Um, if I come and jump into Ramsey, all right. So here, chapter three. Okay, I'm I'm gonna mostly be on the iPad, but I'll I'll go through some of the beginning slides. And actually, um, I'm I'm gonna go in a slightly different order than I have it in the slides. Okay, in the slides, I'm kind of like introduce Ramsey sort of, and then talk about optimization, and then go back to Ramsey. I'm just gonna talk about optimization today first. And then, um, then we can see how to apply that to a Ramsey style problem, uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, but first, I do actually do need to tell you a little bit more about continuous time stuff. Okay. Uh, so let me do that. All right. So, um, and in particular, we're going to look at continuous discounting. Okay. So we haven't because we're doing solo. Oops. Because we were doing solo, we haven't really talked about preferences because they they don't, in some sense, matter in solo. Uh, they don't affect the dynamics of the economy, in in uh, at all. People just consume it, and and, and whatever happens happens. Okay. So, um, but but we do need that for Ramsey. Okay, because what we're do we're we're going to do for Ramsey, I guess I should say, is endogenize S. We're going to endogenize the savings rate. So so we need to know how that decision is made. So we need to think about preferences, discounting, and also optimization. Okay, and that's what we're going to do here. Um, okay, so discounting. You've probably seen beta before, right? I assume you call beta your discount rate in discrete time, right? 
Maybe it's 0.95, maybe it's 0.9, maybe it's 0.99, who knows, okay? My beta is like 0.2 on a weekly basis, okay? I have a very short time horizon. Uh, I just I just live in the moment, okay? Um, but most people's betas are more, I think. Uh, but, you know, so it's just a number between 0 and 1, okay? And it has units of per year, I guess. No, 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 it has units of per time. I, you know, what it can be, anyway. but generally when people say like beta 0.95, it's implicitly that's your discount rate per year. Okay, but you do need to associate a time horizon with, with a discount rate in any case, right? Um, so what we're gonna have in continuous time world is gonna be row, and that's just gonna be positive. I guess I'll write it all fancy and say it's like bracket zero infinity like this, okay? I mean, it could, in principle, be zero, I guess, so we'll, we'll rule that out most of the time. Uh, zero to infinity, so that's some positive number, okay? So this is what we're going to do in continuous time, okay? And I'm going to kind of show you how they, they relate, all right? And I'm going to use the same kind of method that I did um, before, is is start in a discreteized version where we're moving along in discrete time steps of size delta, and then take that delta time step to zero to, to go into the continuum case, all right? So, so, so delta is our time step. Okay, uh, yeah, and so what we're gonna say is, okay, well, if, if we have a, a certain length of time t, an actual length of time t, then, you know, and we have n time steps of time delta, that means that, that you know, we're breaking t into n delta steps of time steps. So this, this equation here must be true by definition. This is how we're defining delta, I guess, okay? So um, think about a, a, an amount of time t elapsing, okay, and we're breaking that to n delta size time steps. Okay. Um, all right. And so then uh, if we want to think about the relationship between beta and rho, okay, kind of the way I'm going to say it is that beta is going to be one minus delta times rho. Okay. So this is, this is more of like an assertion, I guess, or a statement of analogousness. Okay. So it's, I'm not really like proving it, but I'm saying like, if we want to think about like it's an assertion, you know, if, if, if we're looking over a time step delta with a continuous discount rate row, okay, then the way you do it is one minus, you, you, your effective beta would be one minus delta times row, okay? And then if you think about um, what would beta to the t correspond to, so, so in, in uh, let's see, so, so in discrete time world, like let, let's say that the, the period of time is like a year. So over T years, uh, your your total discount rate over that time period would be beta to the T. Okay, so the, the analog here would then just be, well, you know, I'm just taking this thing to the T power. Okay, one minus delta rho to the T. Okay. Um, or no, sorry. Give it to the N. Okay, so... Uh, Would be the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It would be to the end. Okay. Um. I guess what I'm saying here is, yeah. So the so I guess what I'm implicitly saying here is that, um. Beta is a discrete time discount rate over that step size delta. Okay. So I guess it's easier if you think about delta as like a year. Okay. Beta is your yearly discount rate, okay? So then beta corresponds to one minus delta times rho. And then for to go t years, okay, then you would do beta to the t equals one minus delta rho to the n, okay? Um, something seems like mildly not right about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't know if I should write an equality there or not, okay? But but over this t period time, you know, if, if our, if our uh, discounting is one minus delta rho for uh, time period delta, then over this entire t, then it should be that thing to the n because we've got delta time steps. Okay, so we, we have our you know, zero to t. Okay, and we're just breaking this up into size delta time steps and there are n of those in total. Okay, so if are, you know, basically what we're doing is saying, okay, over one of these things, our discount rate is one minus delta rho, and there's n of them, 
then the, the overall discount rate should be that thing, one minus delta times rho to the n, okay? Um, all right, so that's what we get here. And then what we're gonna do is work with this a little bit and then take the limit as delta goes to zero and we're gonna get something. And it's gonna be, it's going to be an exponential discount rate, but we'll see how that works. Okay. It doesn't, it only takes a second. Okay. So basically, actually I have this in the slide. I think, um, I think I have a nice derivation of the slides. Okay. So, uh, what are we going to get? Well, well, what we can do, I guess, first is write this as Delta Rho instead of N, we can write T over Delta. Okay, so that's just using this equation. So in this equation, if you solve it for n, you get n equals t over delta. So we just plug that in here. Okay, so now we have something that only has rho, which we know, which is like a constant, like a parameter, t, which is like a a thing. It's a thing that we're doing this as a function of, and then delta, which we're going to take the limit of. Okay, so at the end, we're going to kind of eliminate delta because we're taking the limit as delta goes to zero. We'll be left with something involving rho and t, which is which is what we want. Okay. Um, okay. And then, uh, yeah, so th there's a couple, there's like kind of like two ways to do this. So, so, so first of all, I mean, basically this is like, um, if you, if you've seen the, the, sort of that definition of E or of the exponential, right. It kind of looks like this where you're like, you know, imagine taking Delta to zero, you've got something very slightly less than one inside here, but then you're raising it to a higher and higher power. Right, so those two things are kind of counteracting one another. The question is like, where does it go? Well, it turns out that it goes to like e. Basically, that's like a definition of e. And so let me let me make sure I get this right. So like, the 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 equation that I guess I'll appeal to here is that if you one definition of e, as in the base of the natural logarithm, is one plus x raised to the one over x to the limit as that goes to zero. Okay. So this is, and, and another way you can write it is like, uh, kind of like the right-hand side, or actually the left-hand side limit is one minus x, the minus one over x. Okay, so these are these are both equal to e. Okay. Um, that's true. Yeah, that's true. So these these are both going to be equal to e. Okay. So um, it's just the one of the definitions. Okay. So, uh, but you can also prove it directly too, um, if you want. So let's, let's do that. Okay. So, uh, one way you can prove this directly is using like, kind of like L'Hopital's rule. Okay. So I think maybe you've probably seen this trick, um, in working with a CES function, maybe at some point, like it with Misha when he was proving stuff about CES converging to copy like this, you end up using a similar trick, but if you haven't seen it before, that's fine too. Okay, so, um, but but we want to what we want to do is think about the limit uh, as delta goes to zero of this quantity. Okay, this like discounting quantity. Okay, so we're making those time steps smaller and smaller and smaller, and so the the how much we discount for each time step goes gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But we have more of the time steps, and so we're figuring out what's the net effect of that. All right, in the limit. Uh, so what you can do here is. Well, this is going to be the limit as delta goes to zero of you kind of exponentiate and logify the thing first. Okay. And so here, this to the uh, T over delta two, three. Okay. So just inside there, we exponentiate and, and take the log that that's, those are inverses of one another. That's fine. Uh, exponential is a continuous function over this domain. So we can pull that out of the limit. All right. So then, or rather push the limit inside, I guess. All right. So then we get this limit of the log of this fella here. All right. Uh, and then I guess we can use the property of logarithms, okay, uh, to bring this T over delta down out front, okay? And I'm actually gonna put it in the denominator. All right, so then the limit 
as delta goes to zero of what the log of one minus delta rho. And so then you get a T over delta out front, but then in the denominator, that's delta over T. Okay. All right, so so there, this is where we're at. Okay, and now this, we have a we have the exponential outside. Then the limit is of a ratio, and both when the del when delta goes to zero, the top thing goes to log one, which is zero, and the bottom thing goes to zero. Ratio of two of a limit of things that go to zero. That means L'Hopital's rule. Okay. So L, I like I like writing L'Hopital's name. Okay. All right, L'Hopital. Now remember, there's no S there. It's not hospital. For some reason, there's no S there. Uh, but that's an easy way to remember it. It looks like hospital, right? Um, okay, so then what do we get here in the in, when we use L'Hopital's rule? Uh, well, you just take the derivative of each side and evaluate that at uh, delta equals zero, okay? So what do we get? Uh, okay, I always screw this up. Um, we're gonna get minus row. So from the chain rule, we're gonna get a minus row and then one over one minus delta row. That's the, the derivative of the top, unevaluated at least. And then over for this one, it's just one over one over t. Okay. And then like we're evaluating this at delta equals zero, where we're going to. All right. And we do that, then it gets it gets much simpler. Okay, so then that this thing disappears, it turns into one. This guy just jumps up top. Okay, and so we're gonna get in the end uh, e to the minus rho t. Okay, so that's great. Okay, so now we get e to the minus rho t, which is reasonable. Okay, so that's that's how we that that's sort of a derivation uh, step by step of how you you sort of take that discrete. Uh, discretized system and the continuous limit, uh, and you get that discounting with a discount continuous time discount rate rho is e to the minus rho t. Okay, so we're going to use that from now on. Okay, um, and so that means, uh, like the let's see, so the, the way we're going to use that is, uh, oops, you know, it, we're going to, you know, for instance, if you want to think about a utility function for some c, like function okay so the way i'll write this is like you have some function c of t or from t equals zero to infinity this is a consumption stream okay rather than a value it's it's a function a whole stream of consumption of time series okay so sometimes i write that like a little vector thing it's like an infinite dimensional vector but nonetheless um so if we want to evaluate the utility of that then you would just write you know the integral from zero to infinity of uh uh, u of c of t, um, e to the minus rho t, dt. Okay, so, uh, right, so so this is an assumption about utility implicitly. Okay, it's just saying that you, the way you value utility stream is linearly separable across time. You just say, okay, at each time, put it in my little utility function, little u, evaluate that, and then integrate that using, uh, Geometric, I guess this is called geometric. I, I think geometric or exponential discounting uh, uh, over time. Okay, so this is an assumption, it really, but it, it's an assumption that we're generally going to use uh, that, that your uh, utility is time separable. Okay. Um, all right, so that's that's kind of discounting. All right, I think that's all. That's all we really need. Okay, and and it it uh, yeah, I mean it makes things easier. Okay, so and we're the, you know if you don't have that, then things get a lot harder. Okay, so that's how we're gonna have it, but it's not always true. I mean, I guess uh, I don't know what one of my grad school friends had this paper. I think she defined it as like an experiential good, like a vacation. You know, like you don't go on like a really small vacation every day. I guess you go to sleep, but like you know, like a vacation is something you do every so often. Okay, um, and uh, you might en you might enjoy the vacation later on by thinking about it and remembering how great that vacation was, or thinking, "Oh, I'm going to go on vacation soon." Right? So, like, there's stuff that just doesn't fit in this framework. Okay, but a lot of stuff does. 
uh, like, like, you know, food, shelter, all that. Okay. Um, okay. So, so we're going to do that and, and, and move ahead with that assumption. Okay. And then I guess the next thing we need, all right, so we've, we've done discounting. Okay. So we can think about utility, all right, of consumption streams. Um, we, I guess we need to do optimization. Okay. So we're going to do optimization. Boom. All right. So, uh, continuous time optimization. Actually, I think it's pretty cool. All right. Um, some neat stuff and it, and it, sometimes it makes problems that are quite difficult in uh, discrete time turn out to be a little easier. Okay. Uh, and, and part of that is like in continuous time, like no, like things don't happen at the same time in continuous time in discrete time. Like if you have like five different things that may or may not happen, that means you have two to the five possible outcomes and you need to like sum up all over the, over all of those in continuous time. It's like, because it, time is a continuum, the probability of two things happening at the same time is measure zero. And so, uh, you know, you can, you can just treat them kind of separately. Okay. So we'll see that you won't see that quite now, but later on, when we start doing more stochastic things, we'll, we'll see that showing up. Okay. But even in this, um, uh, deterministic case, like we're going to do now, um, I, I think it is a little, all right, it, it's notationally just a little easier. Okay. So, so let's, let's do optimization. So I'm going to give you uh, ultimately, if a relatively general um, uh, optimization toolkit, so it's called Hamiltonian optimization. All right, um, and and eventually we'll also do like the the direct like value function analog. Okay, so I guess um, you know, so so the Hamiltonian is is a little bit like the sequential formulation where you have like t t plus one and so on in discrete time. Although it's, I think it's a little better. Um, and then the value function formulation also exists in continuous time. That's very closely analogous to the value function formulation in discrete time. Okay. Uh, but we'll see both. All right. So, but so to, to talk about the Hamiltonian stuff first, all right, I, I guess I'm going to give you a, an example of a finite horizon problem and where we're just going to like attack it using standard Lagrangian techniques and like a little integration by parts trick. And then I'll show you the full theorem, just like, hey, here's how you solve a general uh, continuous time optimization. Okay, so so for, but first we're going to do uh, general in the sense of general functional form and also infinite horizon. Okay, so but first we're going to do finite horizon. Okay, that was borderline unintelligible, illegible, but whatever. Okay, finite horizon. Um, so what's I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a an optimization problem, okay? So we're gonna look at uh, zero to one is our time horizon, okay? Uh, we're gonna have some utility. So this is basically just what I wrote above. Um, so I'm gonna, what I wrote above. So u of c of t uh, e to the minus rho t dt. All right, but the only difference is at zero to one. Uh, and then we're gonna have some constraints, okay? And these constraints, I guess I should have talked about these earlier. These constraints are budget constraint. It's basically a budget constraint, okay? Which is saying that you have some assets, okay? So the problem here is a, it's a consumption savings problem. You you have you do some consumption and you have uh, asset uh, stock or um, position, okay? Um, but let me write it out. And then I'll uh, tell you kind of what it means. So R A of T plus W minus C of T. Okay, so basically R A, you have some assets A to be to start the period, uh, the instant. Um, you get a rate of return R. Okay, and yeah, it's just a proportional per every unit of asset you get, you get a certain amount of return R financially. Uh, you make a wage W, you just have a, you, you work one unit of time, and that's your income. Okay, that's your capital and labor income combined. Subtract off your consumption, and that's everything else you put in the bank. Okay, so another another way to write this is I would say like a proper budget constraint would say, okay, well, I, in fact, you know, basically eight out of t your investment, which is your change in your asset position, how much you're putting in the bank, uh, plus your consumption is going to be equal to your income, which is capital income plus your wage. 
Okay, so that's that's I think a little bit kind of a more intuitive way to, to think about this, but it's the same thing, right? Um, and so so you know this this is like a budget equation sense of of, of spending and, and income. Uh, here it's more like this is a law of motion for a dot. A dot is your income minus whatever you consume. All right. Uh, so a is your state variable and c is your choice variable. And and you choose C and A evolves however it does, and that, that determines your utility. Okay. But 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 I guess implicitly you're kind of choosing A two. It's just it has to satisfy that constraint. Okay, so you're choosing both paths from T equal to zero to one, uh, and they have to satisfy that constraint. Okay. Uh, the only other things are for this case, it's just a little easier to say that AFT has to be positive. You can't borrow. Okay, so you just have some money. Okay, and um, let's say a of, I should write a of zero is equal to a sub zero, which is positive. Okay, so you start out with some assets somehow, and you consume it. You can you burn those down. You can pile them up. You can do whatever you want, uh, and you're going to consume out of that. All right, so um, that's pretty much it. So it's just easier to, to make it so you can't borrow because... We haven't really said, you know, what if you hit period one and you owe the bank like a million bucks? Who cares? You're out of there, you know? Just do it. Uh, so if you, if you don't have that constraint, then the problem becomes really weird, right? And not, not particularly well-defined because you can just borrow however much you want, okay? And that kind of relates to, you probably heard something like a no Ponzi condition or a borrowing constraint, you know, um, in discrete time. So, you know, you, you need to even, especially when you go to infinite horizon, you need to have some bound on how far you can go in terms of your asset position on the negative side to keep things kind of honest. Okay. Um, all right. So that's our optimization problem there. Okay. Uh, so so the, the, when I say we're going to, we're going to tag this with pure Lagrangian tools. Okay. So we're just going to use a Lagrangian method, which is that we have a constraint. Really, we have a continuum of constraints from zero to one. Okay. And they all have to hold. And that and that's our those are constraints and then we have a, an objective. Okay. Right, I'm I'm on the basement here, so if you hear any like noises, it's just my kid throwing stuff around upstairs. Okay. Um the uh yeah, so so the, that's our Lagrangian approach. Okay, and I guess yeah, so it's because we have a continuum from zero to one, we're gonna have Lagrange multipliers for each time instant that's so that it's just like lambda of t, where t goes from zero to one. Okay, so then so like this so people sometimes write it like this. The Lagrange multiplier associated with that is going to be lambda of t. Okay. Um, and then the, for this constraint, the a, a being positive, we're just going to kind of, we're, we're not going to write it as an explicit constraint and we're going to cook it up so it, it, it'll hold no matter what. Okay. So, so we're not going to, yep. Yeah, I don't think it's going to bind. Okay. So with that, we can write, um, our Lagrangian. Okay. So our Lagrangian is going to be, so here, you know, we're writing the whole objective function. All right. Plus all our Lagrangians. Okay. Because there's a continuum, we have to integrate them. So Lambda of T times that constraint. Okay. And so, so, you know, we really are writing it as like a of zero or equals zero, uh, equation. Okay. So then it, we're going to have a minus a dot of T here, uh, DT. Okay. All right. So that's, that's our Lagrangian our objective, which is an integral plus our constraints, which we're integrating over rather than summing because it's a continuum. All right. Okay. So this is a little tricky because we, you know, we, you know, we can take uh, derivatives with respect to C of T. Okay. And we can take derivatives with respect to A of T. Okay. Because remember, we're optimizing over both C and A, right? But but with A, with C, I think it, it I mean, it makes sense. Um, with A, uh, it's a little tricky because, you know, A is going to show up here. So we took the derivative with respect to A. We're going to get lambda of A, some A of T, I guess. So we're taking derivatives with respect to like C of T and A of T, specific T's. Okay. So if you take the derivative respect of a of t, well then you get lambda of t r equals zero. Or do we do we somehow incorporate this? Okay, so the question is how does this go in? Because like you know, kind of if you change a of t, then like you're kind of changing the derivative of like things near t. 
but it's not clear like how because there's a continuum, you know. So uh, it's not obvious. Okay, so so what we're gonna do to just not have to think about that is get rid of a a dot of t. Okay, and the 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 way we do that is by using this integration by parts. Okay, so think about we have some lambda for this term we have lambda t times a dot of t. When we integrate by parts, we're gonna take this dot and put it on top of lambda instead. Okay, that, that's gonna be the net effect. And when we do that, then we can take a derivative with respect to this a, and this lambda is gonna have a dot, but that's fine. Okay, so it's just like, it's kind of cheating, but it, it works. Okay, so um, yeah, that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so, so what I'm gonna write out as like a sidebar is uh, that integral. So this is this is the particular term that we're interested in addressing. This uh, lambda times a dot, right? That's what we want to transform. Everything else is kind of well behaved. Okay, so then integration by parts is going to say that uh, you know. So this is like uh, u dv. That's how I learned it in high school. I don't know if everyone does that, but maybe, you know, the u is the the uh, the integrated thing, and then dv here. Okay. Uh, cause this is, um, like D A D T, right. And if you know, D A D A D T times D T. So it's like, kind of like D A, right. So it's U D V. Um, so what you're going to get is, uh, U V it's basically U V at one minus U V at zero. So that's like that first U V term. Okay. So you're going to get Lambda one, uh, A of one minus Lambda zero a of zero. So that's like that first part of the integration by parts formula minus integral from zero to one of V du. So now it's, it's Lambda dot of T or, or in other words, you just switch where the dot is, right? DT. Okay. So that, that's what integration by parts gets you is that you can move the derivative over to the Lambda and then you you just pick up these things. Okay. But these things are just constants. When we take derivatives, they're going to disappear. So in some sense, we don't care about them. All right, so we're just going to kind of forget about it. So at the end of the day, you can just replace this with this, basically. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes. So if you look so on the slides, uh let's see. So actually on, on the slide. So so um we're gonna do that. That so so we're gonna have these lambdas here, and then I'm gonna turn those into oh actually you know, I, I I didn't update the actual website. Um here it is the updated version. So uh we're gonna have like lambdas ultimately, and then we're gonna sub in a present value version, which is just mu with like that uh, inverted discount rate. And so we'll do that in a minute. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that does make things a lot easier. Okay. So, uh, all right. So let's let's plug that back in. Take some derivatives, and then we'll probably have enough time to to do that. Talk about the present value version, and then I think the general case will have to come in, in next class. Okay. Um, all right, so what do we get? Okay, can I? I'm gonna do an investment in attempting to like lasso stuff. Oh, I just remember the what I did last year. Uh, I know I did this last year because like whenever I would lasso stuff, I'd make a sound effect, I'd be like yow, like a, a cowboy lassoing something. And they said that my my lasso sound was. Uh, it was, it was weak. It wasn't, it wasn't enthusiastic enough. Um, so how, how do I paste stuff? That's the question. All right. I'm going to give this one more try and then I'm just going to give up on lassoing things. All right. Mm-hmm. So I can move it, but that's not what I want to do. I want to. Nope. You 
You guys use this thing? You know how to paste stuff? Yeah, maybe I should do that. If I press and hold, it just like doesn't do anything. Okay, so I've copied it. Oh, I see. Let me. Yeah, here we go. Right. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so that was like obviously. I could have just written the whole thing in that time, but I've learned something now. So it's like an investment, right? So in the future, I know how to do that. All right. Um, okay. So that plus, all right. Now this is going to, this second integral is going to be slightly different. Okay. Because, uh, well, we're going to, we're going to have some of these original terms. Okay. And then we're going to have like, I guess I should, these are all these are all a big giant integral anyway, but um, I'll keep them separate here. Now we're going to have minus lambda dot of t a of t dt. Okay, so yeah, I, I you could also just combine these two integrals because they're both zero to one time integrals, but it doesn't make a big difference. Okay, so um, all right, so now this is where we can then take derivatives and hope for the best. Okay, so we're we're going to take a derivative with respect to c and a. Set those to zero. Lagrange multipliers will still be there, but that's fine. Okay, so then we get del L, del C, I guess of T, right? Okay, which is going to give us U prime of C of T, E to the minus rho T. All right, and so we're taking the derivative with respect to C of T, not T, right? So that's why we don't get a chain rule C prime or anything, T dot or anything like that. Okay. Uh, and then the only other place C is going to show up is in uh, lambda of T times C of T. And so you just get lambda of T. Okay. And so what you see here is that that lambda, it's just the, the marginal utility of consumption from um, from the present, from zero, from the perspective of time zero. Okay. Which this, this is where that present versus current value dichotomy will come in, but this is in the, in the time zero perspective. Okay. Um, right. So you can see this, just this a equals B. Okay. Um, and then for del a of T. All right. So the, the utility objective doesn't show up at all. Okay. So what we're left with is Lambda of T times R from this term. And then also we're going to get a minus Lambda dot of T equals zero. Okay. So not too bad. Okay. I've certainly seen worse, all right? Uh, and I guess I need to do a new page. Um, so I'll just I'll just write those here, I guess. Or I could lasso them. I could lasso. I'm going to lasso. I'm in a lassoing mood. All right, so do that here. OK. There we go. All right, so these are over here. I wish I could just have like an infinite length page, but that's that's not a thing. Um, okay, so then uh, that's what we started with there. Okay, and that um, will mean, of course, that these are just equalities. Lambda of t and lambda of t times r is equal to lambda of t. Okay. So you can see that, you know, first one just says that the, the lambda tracks this being a marginal utility. The second one basically is saying that the growth rate of lambda is R, right? Which is time invariant. Okay, so the growth lambda, R, R and W are time invariant. I didn't, spell, I didn't say that explicitly before, but they're just fixed numbers for, for this case. In general, they could be, we'll do the case where they're time varying too, but these are just fixed numbers. So it's just saying that lambda is growing exponentially or shrinking as it may be. Uh, I guess probably it's growing at some rate. Okay, probably R is positive. Okay. Um, okay, and then the, the last thing I guess I'll do is is the the, the present value formulation or the current current value formulation. I forget what it is, but we're gonna we're gonna redefine we're gonna define a new multiplier called mu of t, which is e to the rho t times lambda of t which is going to get rid of that exponential. Okay. Uh, so I, I think the best way to, to think about this is that, um, well, well, one, one implication of this is that the growth rate of mu is, well, if you think about the product rule, it's just going to be 
the growth rate of e to the rho t, which is exactly rho, okay, uh, plus the growth rate of lambda, of lambda, which is lambda that over lambda, okay, and hence, um, did I, I, I might, let me make sure I didn't put in the, uh, <clears throat> a negative sign when I shouldn't have. No, it should be positive. Oh, did I miss? Hold on. I missed one, I think. Ah, okay, sorry. I made a slight mistake here. I'll fix that. Okay, so here, there's a double negative, so this should be a Plus, when I sub, because this, when I did the integration by price, you have that negative integral, but this was already a negative. Okay, so this should actually be a plus here. And so this is a plus here. Okay, sorry about that. This is a plus here. And then the equality itself is a, is a minus. Okay, so, so the growth rate of lambda is minus r instead of r. Okay, but otherwise everything is the same. Okay, and hence this thing says rho minus r. Okay, so that's that's how it should be. All right, so that's that's the growth rate of mu. Okay, so then, uh, and then just going, if we're going to transform both equations. Okay, so the first one here, move this over, you get lambda times e to the rho t, which is mu. Okay, so then that, that means that u prime of c of t is equal to mu of t. That's the first equation, and then the second equation, basically you can write as mu dot over mu is equal to rho minus r. Okay, so uh, yeah, okay, so that that's I'm out of time basically, but but just to give you an idea of how do you how would you actually use these two equations? These characterize the solution, but what does it really mean? The this the sort of the algorithm I guess you could call it um, for finding the solution would be okay. Well, there's still an unknown, which is um, like basically what's your initial consumption? Okay, so if you know if you know your initial consumption. Okay, you can find C zero, you can find mu of zero. Once you know mu of zero, given that mu is growing at a constant rate, rho minus r, you can project out the, the full time path for mu, plug it back in here to get the full time path for consumption. Use your budget equations to get the full time path for assets. So like if you're consuming a lot, your assets are gonna deplete and vice versa. And what, is there a condition that pins it all down? The condition is, always die with zero assets, okay? Or end the game with zero assets, right? You don't wanna end up with assets at the end because you could have consumed those. And that would, if you didn't consume them, that's not an optimum, okay? You don't have any descendants, whatever, okay? Um, so that that's that final constraint, basically through that chain of logic I just gave you, the A of one equals zero constraint or like optimality condition, which we just sort of assert is gonna pin down everything else and particularly like your initial consumption and hence, the entire path of consumption and assets. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump back to that next time, but that's that's sort of how you can think about it if you wanted to go through and explicitly solve it. And you can actually do it explicitly for like um, a fairly general class of utility functions. It's a little messy, but you can actually do it the whole thing explicitly too. Okay, so we'll talk more about that next time. And we'll also jump into the general optimization framework, like a, a general toolkit for solving continuous time optimizations.